Welcome to the webinar, Interviewing Victims of Human Trafficking and Sexual Exploitation, Techniques and Tactics. Today's program is sponsored by Equitas, the prosecutor's resource on violence against women. <laughs> My name is Charlene Whitman, and I'm an Associate Attorney Advisor at Equitas. For the best use of iLink, please call into our conference line using the number 530-881-1212, passcode 202 731738, and please call in from a landline. If you're using a mobile phone, do not please also use a speaker option. And that number is located in the upper left-hand portion of your screen if for some reason you're disconnected throughout today's webinar or if you need that number. You can also connect using the internet audio on the start page, clicking the connect button. If you have any technical issues during today's presentation, please use the iLink hand raise indicator, which is located on the toolbar in the top left-hand portion of your screen, or you can contact iLink directly at 1-800-799-4510. Throughout today's webinar, questions may be posed to all participants, and you can respond to those questions using the iLink feedback indicator located on the left-hand side of your screen. You can also post comments or questions via private chat to me, Charlie Whitman, and I will share your questions anonymously with our presenters so that they can be addressed during today's webinar. Public chat has been disabled throughout the duration of today's presentation. Today's webinar is presented by Equitas, the prosecutor's resource on violence against women, through funding from the United States Department of Justice Office on Justice Program Bureau of Justice Assistance. Equitas's mission is to improve the quality of justice in sexual violence, intimate partner violence, stalking and human trafficking cases by developing, evaluating, and refining prosecution practices that increase victim safety and offender accountability. And I just want to make a small correction. Today's program, um, today's presentation is brought to you, is supported by the grant awarded by the U.S. Department of Justice Office on the Violence Against Women. A handout version of today's presentation and the biographies of our presenters will be sent to you following today's webinar, as well as a survey link for your, for your feedback and critiques. Today's presenters are Executive Director and Founder of Courtney's House, Tina Front, Fairfax, Virginia Detective Bill Wolf, Jr., and Equitas Attorney Advisor, Victoria Christensen. Tina Front is the Founder and Executive Director of Courtney's House. And Courtney's House provides direct services to both survivors and their families, as well as trainings and curriculum for others to ensure survivors are being provided with the proper therapeutic and treatment programs. As a survivor of domestic sex trafficking, Tina is a, national, is a national, nationally renowned expert on how to best assist boys and girls who are transitioning out of the life. Bill Wolf is the leader, lead investigator for the Northern Virginia Human Trafficking Task Force. Detective Wolf is responsible for investigating and coordinating the response to all forms of human trafficking. Prior to joining Equitas, Vicki served as a Deputy Attorney General and Special Assistant to the Attorney General of New Jersey. She also served as a Senior Attorney at the National Center for the Prosecution of Violence Against Women as an and as an Assistant District Attorney in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I now want to turn the floor over to Vicki for the substantive portion of today's webinar. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, Bill, Tina, Charlie, and I have been planning this webinar for quite some time, and we're really thrilled to be able to interact with all of you this afternoon. The webinar is really geared toward law enforcement and prosecutors because we are the ones who tend to have the challenges interviewing victims, interviewing survivors. However, it's important for everybody who practices along the criminal justice system continuum to have these skills because, as we know, victims are going to present anywhere along that continuum and certainly outside of it. So, of course, more so than any other crime, if, if we're not sharing information on a regular basis and if we're not working together, we're going to absolutely fail in our efforts to support victims and be able to hold offenders accountable. So. By having um, three professionals present together, we, we want, really want to stress to you that this is what should be happening in your practice, that you've got to be communicating on a daily basis. At the conclusion of this webinar, you will be better able to identify dynamics of trafficking and sexual exploitation and tactics that our traffickers and exploiters use, establish a rapport with 
at-risk individuals and victims in a supportive manner, apply an understanding of trafficking and exploitation dynamics to an interview with a, convert, a confirmed victim or one who you suspect could be a victim, and communicate with other allied criminal justice professionals on emerging issues and trends in order to best prepare. A note about terminology, um, we're going to use victim and survivor interchangeably, and we are going to, when we're discussing demand, use the term buyer instead of John. So we wanted to start by giving you just a sense of what's being reported to Polaris Project, um, National Human Trafficking Resource Center call hotline. The most common forms of sex trafficking involve pimp control prostitution, commercial front brothels, and export services. And again, these are calls that are going to their hotline. 41% of the sex trafficking cases reference United States citizens as victims, and 85% of their calls regarding sex trafficking reference women as victims. These calls are noting that trafficking is occurring at hotels, motels, on the street, at truck stops, commercial front brothels, residential brothels, residential brothels, and it's often facilitated, as we know, online. We highly encourage you, if you look at the bottom of this slide, um, the Chicago Alliance Against Sexual Exploitation, we highly encourage you to visit their website. It's www.caase.org. And really what this agency does is it looks at the root causes of sexual exploitation. It looks at pimps, traffickers, buyers. And CASE, this organization, has done several studies focused on demand in the Chicago area, but certainly these studies are applicable across the country. Um, the studies really focus on who's buying, what they think about, and the study that's referenced on this slide um, included 113 men who purchased sex. They were recruited through Craigslist, the Chicago Reader, and Chicago After Dark, and then they were interviewed by the researchers. The study showed that our purchasers are purchasing anywhere between the ages of 20 and 71, and the average age of a buyer is 39. So what case and what we want to stress is that when it comes to educating our males, we really want to start focusing on prevention in high school because males are purchasing for the first time when they're about college age, so we want to get to them before they get to be that age. 53% purchase as frequently as once a month, or several times a week. 62% had a regular sex partner, a girlfriend or a wife. And as we as prosecutors know, this is often something that our jurors really have a difficult time getting over with, and not only when we're prosecuting traffickers, but when we're prosecuting rapists. Um, and that in terms of their beliefs, they absolutely believe that when a man is paying a woman for sex, she should do anything that he asks. And this is very consistent with what we know, that buyers, um, the fuel for demand, they are perpetrators of violence and rape and other crimes against our girls, our boys, our women, and our men. And so I just, before we move into some more things, I just want to throw out a question um, to Bill. Bill, knowing all this, in terms of how we as a system, you know, we've already talked about prevention and education, but do we need to be doing, for example, more undercover things where we're focused on buyers, or are there other things that we can be doing to immediately address demand? And certainly, Tina, you can respond as well. Well, I think the, you highlighted the first thing, and that is that we need to be raising awareness. Um, we need to raise awareness among our male population uh, with regards to the victimization. Um, so often uh, we in the general community just don't understand the level of victimization that goes into these situations where they believe that these girls are consenting to engage in this type of sexual conduct. So raising awareness I think is key. And then within law enforcement, um, partnering with uh, prosecutors, I think that we do need to not necessarily shift our focus but broaden our focus when dealing with human trafficking cases to start being more inclusive of addressing the demand side. I think we're starting to see that 
on the state level as uh, various states are starting to institute new laws that um, are, have harsher punishments with regards to those that are purchasing sex, and then also being able to prosecute those on the federal level as well. Tina? Well, yeah, I think that's really important, but what is the importance of building the case and for prosecutors building the case on the demand and also for investigators investigating the cases? What is the importance of it? Well, here's the thing. A lot of times the buyers bring boys and girls into the sex trafficking situation, and it's not always the initial pimper trafficker that we're thinking of. And so perfect example, and we're working a broad population as well, what actually happens is maybe they did run away, but an older man actually is the one that talks to them, brings them back to their home, and then they drop them off on the track where traffickers are. And so right then and there it was actually one of the buyers who brought them in, also to trace money. So these repeat customers, who are they? Well, they're men with a lot of money. And what part do they have within the trafficker? Well, building a case on a buyer helps you with your case on the trafficker because it's going to lead to how many times this buyer has actually called to set up parties where they brought girls into prostitution and maybe minors as well. So asking these questions will help build a case to even detect how many men are breaking girls into it and also the demand piece. So let's think about the whole dynamic. And each one, gang control, pimp control, gang, everyone has a different dynamic and a different buyer. That's important because different buyers go to gang control situations. That will also help build a tech case on the gangs and going back into the buyer. So I really think they play a huge play in all of this, the demand, because they also help set things up, bring survivors into being forced into prostitution as well. And also, we have to move survivors because of the men. What about these men who buy sex who are not getting arrested? And they see our survivors and they're still confronting them and asking them to purchase, to buy sex from them. So I think that's really important as well, to send that message to the survivors that the man and arresting men who repeatedly rape them is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we've got to do a better job of asking those questions. Yeah. Tina? Sorry, I had a little issue with the system over here. Okay, I really want to explain and kind of talk about different things that survivors endure in the life. We know the general. We know more of the general and are trained more on the trauma, the rapes, the beatings, but within also understanding the dynamic and the complexity is we have to understand the dynamic of control all the way around to build the case as well. So many survivors are not only beaten by traffickers and buyers, but they also are watching people get killed in front of them. So understanding the dynamic and, and knowing what type of questions to ask aren't just about the pimp and the trafficker. You kind of want to ask questions all about the things that they have seen um, witnessing crimes on others as well will help build investigations back um, on bigger cases that you might, might have opened as well. The race and ethnicity, I think it's important that these statistics are saying that most of the people who are trafficked are all runaways and they all don't have great homes. I think we need to kind of understand the different dynamics of control. If traffickers are looking for boys and girls and that's the target, the targets between 12 and 14 or even younger, the age, then they are thinking of all children that they can manipulate. It doesn't always have something to do with some race. It does have everything to do with what they're missing in their life. So every child thinks they're missing love, even if they have two parents, right, because they may not be there all the time for them. So that is the road the trafficker is going to take. Their approach is going to be different with each survivor. Their approach them watching them may be different, but this is with all backgrounds and culture and races and education. I think it's really important. It's also important to say about 90% of all of our survivors, including myself, were sexually abused before their sex trafficking situation. Now, that is important because, again, that's cross-culture and cross-race as well, that they all were. What are they watching, these traffickers, to know that people have been abused? 
So what is that? I think first we need to think as traffickers as businessmen and as predators who watch their prey. I think that's very important to understand that because that's why it's going to understand the different dynamic of what you're seeing. They may have children who were have um, special needs. We're seeing a lot of that. We're seeing a lot of people right now who are deaf. So why are they targeting the population and to be what their weakness is? I think that's very important to understand from the mind of a trafficker on how they actually go after the different survivors, potential victims. So many of you will recognize um, this image, which um, was adapted from the um, Domestic Abuse Intervention Project's Duluth Model, Power, and Control Wheel. And it was adapted by Polaris. And what is actually really, really helpful, because so many of us, when we have done a certain job in, um, in the criminal justice system for a period of time, um, we sort of think that we already have all the skills that we need to go into another interview, but um, we're, again, trying to stress that we've got to go into these interviews with an increased level of consciousness and cooperation. So when you're preparing for an interview, it's important to remember to remind yourself that some of these dynamics on this wheel can be really, really subtle, and of course, others can be ex very extreme. All of them, all forms of those dynamics can be used to control a victim. And they're further complicated by the fact that not only are some of these victims completely allied with the defendant, um, but, um, and certainly Bill and I have talked a lot about this, but the victims are not self-identifying. They are not self-identifying. Um, and it can take a long time. It can take interviews and discussions with many, many different people, many different professionals. And so I'd like to ask Tina, how can we get to the point with a victim where we are helping her able to be able to self-identify? Well, I think the most important thing is a relationship first. No one's going to give you everything you need in one setting. We would love that, but that's not going to happen. This is really about trust building, and I think it's really important when we hear about trust building that you actually do understand each dynamic of control. That's your key. How can you help anyone if you don't even understand or can grasp anything that they go through or suffer statistics that you read? So I think it's really important to understand each background first. Bill, if you're, uh, you know, in, in terms of your position as law enforcement, you're a trained interviewer. What do you do as a member of law enforcement when a victim hasn't yet reached the stage where she or he is self-identifying? Well, I think some of the key things when when you're at that point is using appropriate language. So often in law enforcement, you know, we assume that. Uh, they self-identify as a victim, we're there as an investigator saying, hey, you are a victim, you need to talk to me, but they, they don't understand. We're not speaking on the same level. And so I think just having that mindset of understanding um, that they haven't quite self-actualized their own victimization at that point is really key. And so you use words that are appropriate to them, words that um, are uh, consistent with the lifestyle that they're leading, words that have meaning to them. Um, and I think that's really important. The rapport building phase is also really key at, at this point because you're asking this victim to disclose some pretty traumatic events to her and you are going to kind of shed light on the fact that they are a victim at some point. And so we have to be very victim-centered when approaching it. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, we have that mindset and uh, her well-being uh, in uh, kind of in our focus as we approach it through building that rapport and that trust relationship with her before we move forward. Yeah. And also we've got to be conscious of this, which is really the common thread in so many trafficking, exploitation, violence against women cases, um, and the one that we collectively have got to do a better job of addressing at the very, very, very beginning of the process. So we in the criminal justice system who work in these cases, particularly when we're thinking about the time that they are getting to the point where um, we're preparing for trial, that these are cases that have been um, charged, that have gone through the preliminary stages of the system, um, it, it is, it, it's almost sad that in so many situations we almost accept witness intimidation as an inevitable consequence of 
these kinds of cases going through the criminal justice system, going through an investigation, preparing for prosecution, and certainly um, through trial. And we can't accept it. We can't accept it at all. Um, we have got to prevent it by having some open conversations with our survivors um, about recognizing it, about um, providing safe avenues for them to share information with us. We've got to be documenting it, and we certainly have to be charging, investigating, and prosecuting it when appropriate. We see this in so many ways, just like this, this slide includes, exploitation of emotional ties, particularly in sex trafficking cases where the defendant and the victim have an intimate relationship. They have been intimate partners in some capacity. Um, there's a promise for future payment. I'm going to pay you next month. I'll pay you next week. There's intimidation related to immigration status. You are here illegally. Um, I have never filed that paperwork for you. You've never filed any paperwork. If you even walk outside of this house, you're going to get caught. They're going to get you. Same thing on intimidation related to lack of understanding of law enforcement. Um, in some cases, there is a language barrier. And even when you have a victim who is a, an English speaker, there's a total misunderstanding in so many cases of the role of law enforcement, or there could have been negative interaction with law enforcement previously, and that certainly, certainly can be exploited by a trafficker um, in order to get them not to report. You know, they're going to get you. Um, there can just be threats all the time to call law enforcement on a victim. Absolutely um, threats that say they're going to arrest you for prostitution or other um, threatened illegal behavior. And certainly traffickers find out where a victim's family is located, whether we're talking about outside of the United States or within, and use that information to issue threats to harm family in that country. And this happens here. Um, I know I have had cases where traffickers used victims' children, um, held the children over the head of the victims as a way of keeping complete control over the victim. Also, they're threatening, uh, in addition to children, other family members and pets as well. And so Vicki, if I could just add, I was just going to comment too, that, um, that you know, we, we see that more and more uh, nowadays with this witness intimidation, whether it's a child that the victim already has or whether it's an effort by the trafficker to impregnate the victim as a means of control and coercion that they have. So they have that child in common. Uh, not only does it, um, you know, kind of lend itself to additional bonding between the victim and offender, uh, but also it's something else to hold over their head. Or they will, they'll buy the, they'll buy the victim um, a dog, uh, so to speak, or a pet that the victim becomes very attached to, and then they will um, hurt the dog if the, if the victim doesn't do what they're supposed to or threaten, you know, additional violence against them. We're seeing more and more the violence being moved away from the victim themselves because the traffickers are realizing that, hey, this is a way for me to get caught. Uh, so they don't want to kind of have that, uh, those bruises and scarring and things on the victim, as well as um, it, it reduces their profit because they don't want to sell a product that is all beaten and bruised and tattered. Um, so instead, they are threatening the violence against dogs, animals, family members. And in gangs, they're using kind of the established fact that gangs are very violent and what kind of the media and Hollywood tells us about gangs and, and retaliation from gangs as a means of coercion and control as well. Sure. And also, I just want to, just to quickly add to that, also inside the jails or detention, juvenile detention, we're also seeing the intimidation by having other females who are inside the juvenile detention fight them or jump them not to testify as well. Tina, thank you so much for bringing that up. And I actually think we could do an entire webinar focused on um, those dynamics, specifically on what's happening when um, you're, you're in confinement, when one is in confinement. So, yeah, there's a lot, a lot that's occurring there. And certainly more that we, as um, part of the system, should be doing about that. Um, but in terms of moving on to um, the dynamics, you know, there, there 
there can be four general models when we're talking about sexual trafficking and exploitation. And, and certainly there are other dynamics, but for purposes of the webinar today, we wanted to break it down into these um, four models. And Tina and Bill are going to talk a little bit about the dynamics associated with each, each of these models. But before we do, um, Charlie, I think there was a question from a participant. <laughs> Yes. So looking at these four models, the participant asked whether or not there are types of sex trafficking that don't fall within those four on the screen right now. Well, as we've already mentioned, I mean, we certainly have um, intimate partner violence. So you're having a situation where um, the trafficking is perpetuated by an intimate partner, whether a boyfriend, a spouse, or, or other um, is, is the perpetrator. And you might be able to say that falls under the family model, but in certain situations, you could consider that its own separate category and dynamic. Bill and Tina, do you want to add anything? Okay. Actually, I'm sorry. No, I'm good. I think I'll answer it right now. Sorry, Tina. Go ahead. Okay, so I, I kind of wanted today really focus on the different dynamics and control and why we break them down that way. I also want to talk about building the case and deeper things to look for. Now, for specific interview questions, you're definitely going to be able to find that on Shared Health's International website. That definitely has the intervene model. Courtney House has just expanded on that model. However, today we're going to focus on the dynamics of it. Health can control. Most people, most people are trained um, on the pimp control and knowing the background on that. But if we dig a little bit deeper, let's talk about that. Most pimps actually do come from a family of pimps. Most of them do come from that. And there is a hierarchy within that. And that's very important if you understand that. could be a reason why you're, the victim feels angry or upset that the trafficker is in jail, but not the rest of the family who may be bothering them. Now, you cannot do this, be a pimp, without having any type of ties with anybody ever. So when we're thinking networks, we have to think bigger into what that means, where they're putting their money in. Most survivors actually know this because they're taken to the different businesses that the pimps may have as well. And they may know the different family members who are involved. Now, is every pimp a family member? No, that's not true. Sometimes they know someone, but good questions are, who are the other pimps they were around? Or who were their turnout folks, which would mean their first pimp that they had? So you can build a case on maybe this is the pimp they're with, but dig a little deeper to build the investigation and case on all the other pimps that were involved as well. Did they own any strip clubs? So the strip clubs, dance clubs, did the girls or boys work in any of those places as well? I think people think, in general, most survivors have used and was addicted to drugs. Different pimps have different rules, but every pimp follows the main rules and has their own rules as well. Not everybody is addicted to drugs, but that also is a big trend in the area too. So if you're in Kansas City where Veronica's voice is run by survivor Christy Childs, they see a lot of people who are addicted to heavy drugs in the Kansas area. So you can trace back that and see, but not everybody's addicted to drugs. I think right now is one of the biggest things happening is that most people know about football, right? We know that people are trafficked to different areas and large events, but it is not just the Super Bowl at all. So in Iowa, it was definitely there, there um, every year they have a big fair, a country fair, and girls and boys were finding a traffic there as well. That's everywhere. So many survivors already know this, but you, any big events that are in the area, it could be marketing events, sales people events, not just sporting, just large group of men. That's important to your questions of the survivor. Not everything has to go back to the trafficker to build the case. Ask different questions um, about that because survivors have seen all of this and they know any attorneys who are on retainer, how much they had to pay for pay, pay people off as well. And then being sold online, not just back pages and for boys. Boys are also sold on back pages as well, but not just back pages, but other Internet sites or pornography videos they were forced to be in are good questions to also ask. And pimps involve you in all of these things. So just know that that's a part of pimp control. Bill, you want to add anything to that? 
I, I was just going to throw in there real quick, um, and this is uh, stemming from a question that we got from a participant with regards to, um, you know, uh, the victim seeing themselves as the pimp's girlfriend and, you know, and them refusing to cooperate in the investigations. When we're dealing with pimp control, a lot of times, not always, there are definitely um, exceptions, but a lot of times the girls do see themselves as the girlfriend of the, the pimp. Um, and so they feel like they're dating him. It's the, you know, there's this love connection, this bond between the two of them. And getting girls that are in this situation um, to cooperate with your investigation can be very difficult. Um, the one thing that I'll tell investigators and prosecutors is be patient. Um, these cases have to be victim-centered. What I found um, is the most effective technique for me is to identify the fact that she is a victim, remove her, recover, rescue her from that particular situation, and get her into services, get her the help that she needs, and let those professionals that can deal with the trauma uh, address those issues first, and then we can circle back around later and, and follow up with our criminal investigation. There are cases where the victims never fully come around that will never cooperate, um, but we can look for other evidence and other ways to prosecute that case. Sometimes we have to get very creative with these cases and think outside of the box, uh, but there are other ways to, to prosecute them. And also, Bill, I think it's crucial for maybe some of us who um, might get a little frustrated at the inability to build a case, that we have got to focus on the positive, that there have been, uh, there's been a rescue, that there have been um, provision of services, and that even if a case isn't built, or even if the victim returns to the situation, that there has been a positive contact with law enforcement, with people who are associated with the system, and that in and of itself can be one step further on the road to recovery. Absolutely, because we may not be able to get her to cooperate at that point, but it, as you said, we've created that positive contact with law enforcement, and so the next time around, even if she does go back to her trafficker, the next time around it's going to be a little bit easier to be able to build that rapport and to recover her from that situation, and then we just keep with it. We have that patience, we stick with it, we realize that this is a crime against another human being, and we focus our resources on recovering these victims, uh, and I think that that's the most effective method. Also, and I just want to jump in, we had a, a participant question asking for just a little bit more explanation on what you're talking about to have an attorney on retainer. Oh, great question. So I mean that a lot of time the traffickers actually do have attorneys that they pay to have on retainer for them. And so many of the girls may have that, or the pimp will have one just specifically for him and his family. That's what I mean. Thank you, Tina. You're welcome. So I think that's going to move us into family control. I think this is a harder one, to be honest with you. If we're talking about that pimp dynamic, we find it a little bit harder for the family control dynamic for the victims to give up their family. So let's talk about what that means to say family control. So family control means that it can be the mother, uh, it can be the father, the uncle, grandmother, or even foster parent who is pimping out the boy or girl and selling them. Now, this is going to look a little bit different. A lot of times this comes in as child sexual abuse because the right questions weren't asked to determine that first. So I am talking about before maybe a pimp control situation. Maybe it started inside the home, especially if the kids are in foster care for child sexual abuse. Usually what we see at Courtney House, because we do work directly with boys and 100% of our boys are in the foster care system and not the girls, we will tell you what we see at Courtney's house is it usually started between the ages of 6 and 10 years old. And for girls, what we're seeing is 9, and that means forced prostitution. And I mean that because we're not asking the right questions about the family side to detect it in smaller children. Now, with family control, that dynamic is actually they are sold online as well. So they're also sold online just like boys, just like uh, girls under pimp control as well. Now, the difference would be that they also use chat lines to sell. So girls are taught to be on chat lines. Those are those chat lines late at night, those numbers that you see. Now, I think this is important, especially for investigations. It's important because it's really hard to secure, a, get a, um, a chat 
tap on one of these chat lines because of the numbers rotate and move around. So you are going to find boys and girls who are forced to sell themselves on chat lines a lot. So what usually happens is they give out the phone number. You have about two to three minutes. You have to kind of throw out your number, and then the buyer calls them directly or the family member. They also work the track. So a lot of time our girls and boys are being family controlled do work outside on the street, but not where pimps are. So not on a pimp control track at all. They usually work with the boys. So yes, boys and transgender, yes, girls also work the same tracks as well. And that's really because the family have them work in groups. And if they go to a pimp control track, then that's the product right there. So they go to different ones on the street as well. It's harder for law enforcement to identify because a lot of boys and girls say they're doing it on their own. So it makes it seem like they're doing it on their own because they don't actually call their family a pimp. So they are saying where they work, but they're not telling you where the money leads back to. It's important to understand that every child, just like on the foreign national side, but they're being controlled by foster parents or parents. They are told that everybody works together as a family and keeps money inside the family. So this is even at five and six and seven years old. So they are told they have to do some type of work. Now, this money may not show in the place that they actually see a money exchange. Kids make it gifts for things. They may say, if you touch this or sit on the lap, this is what we give you at first. They may get items. They may be dropped off at family members or other people's houses for a period of time where they're picked up. But the family is actually the one controlling this. Um, it's really different. It's really difficult because it's the family who is trafficking them. So that is actually what we see as the hardest of giving up all the information about your family member. They usually have other brothers and sisters, other siblings. So our survivors say they'd rather be the one being trafficked and not their younger brothers and sisters. So that's another hard thing to define. Victims, they're going to follow their family instructions, and they're going to know exactly. They listen to the family, so they know what to say. But these kids are also runaways, too. So they also come in at that under that runaway when they're in school. They're out. The parents says they've been so concerned about them. So asking the family, too, the right questions to really determine. Is there anything you want to throw in there, Bill? I think you covered quite a bit. Okay, great. But that, I think that's a perfect leeway to understand how boys are trafficked because, again, a lot of our boys have actually started at home in the family. Remember, it came under child sexual abuse. So before they were placed in foster care, it was their parents who were selling them. Now, not every boy who's being trafficked identifies as gay, so please understand that. But also know that some may identify as transgender or gay as well. Now, I think it's important because a lot of times our boys say they never even were involved in any type of forced prostitution. At first, didn't know anything about it. They ran away because they identified for gay, and a man picked them up because they didn't have a place to stay and offered them something and then dropped them off on the transgender track, and then they were introduced to a family. Now, that family is different. If we ask a boy a pimp control question, he's not going to know any of that. He's going to say he doesn't have a pimp. A lot of times they make the same family dynamic. So that family dynamic would be a mama. The mama is usually a transgender male. So it's a transgender male who controls the family. So everyone works together. There are other boys and girls, and they all live in the house together, and they have to pay rent every day to be serious. So these are some of the terms that may change in different states as well. You do work together as a family. That's really important because you don't work together. All the other boys and girls do not, all the other boys don't speak to you anymore. And you're not allowed in the house. So now you created this family. If you don't work, they have isolated you. You are not allowed to speak to anybody in there. So the dynamic comes under people think that they're called survival sex, right? Most boys, we say, oh, they're not involved. It's survival sex. Well, what if they're 15 or 14? How would they even know where to go and how much to charge? So I think that's really interesting dynamic on the boys. The loyalty to trafficker, again, to me, is family control and on the mama transgender part. That loyalty, having someone accept you when no one else accepted you if you identified as gay or transgender, is important. It's important because they do not want to break that bond. They don't. They still feel that they owe them something because this person accepted me and taught me something that, like a family. And that's what we actually hear the most, that they still may be out of their life but want to go back and give 
the mama and the godmama money and help them support them because they still feel grateful. So I, I think that you can really adapt how victims are in each one. This is really the same type of dynamic, just seen in a different way. Bill, Victoria, you guys want to jump in? Tina, can you talk a little bit about the hormone shots? I think um, there might be some of our attendees who want to hear more about that. Well, let's talk about building a case on the transgender side and the boy side cause, because I actually think it's a little bit easier. Now, it's easier for a few things. With the boys, boys are given hormone shots by the, by the uh, mamas. So I think asking questions about if they ever took them, where did they get them, because it's usually illegally done, asking them about the questions, who gave it to you. The other question I think is really important and also to know is that a lot of times the mamas still work. Right, the transgender male who's calls himself mama, they still work out on the street. They're on track, and they're also in the pictures with the boys who are being so. Now, that's good information to know when you're building the case because they're also working and setting up the dates as well and currently there. So that's a little bit different from temp control. Any other questions on that, Bill? Anyone want to jump in? Tina, I just want to jump in and share one participant question that we had um, had asking, um, well, saying that we often find that victims do not want to be connected to services even after their pimp uh, has been arrested. And this probably also applies um, with the other models you were talking about. How do you bridge the gap between identification and connection to services in a victim-centered way? I think that's a great question. So because we're survivor run, I'm, I'm going to say we can do things a little bit differently. So one of the things that we do at intake, and I'm going to use today's intake as a perfect example to this, um, we like to explain ourselves what Courtney's house is and the services. Explain what your services is and why you do the work you do and what your population is. I like honesty. Survivors like honesty. Also know this. The minute you walked in the door, the minute you got on the phone, it's the minute they paid attention to your body language and already know how exactly they're going to do this interview. Do not seem nervous. Be yourself and don't use words you normally wouldn't use to fit in. And I think that's very important. These may sound basic, but it's on everything on why you would go to a program. You know, don't go on the trafficker and talk anything bad about him. Talk about your services and what you would do to help and give things a choice, a real choice, but a real choice really is. For them, they may not want your services today, but wouldn't it be great if they call next week and they also, because of what you said today. So everything you say, I think it's important, but your body language is one of the most important things. Okay. Well, then, uh, I am actually going to let Bill jump in on the gang's piece. So when we talk about a gang, and this is a really uh, unique subset of individuals that are that are now trafficking girls, and we're seeing it become more and more prevalent across the country right now. I mean, I think it's important that we understand what a gang is. A lot of people think that you know gangs are large organizations that they're very organized in their structure, and that's really not the case. And we're talking about a criminal street gang. Um, essentially, we're talking about three or more persons. Um, where the primary objective of those individuals coming together is the commission of some sort of criminal activity. Uh, that group has an identifiable name, sign, or symbol. And these members, you know, most states require for certification uh, of a criminal street gang that uh, the members have engaged in what are deemed uh, predicate acts. Sometimes these are acts of violence. And I think it's really key that we focus in on this violence piece because a lot of times as investigators and prosecutors, that's where we believe gangs stop. We believe that um, gangs are all about violence, and that is their sole purpose of existing. But what we're finding is is that the reality is uh, that the sole purpose of gangs is not just for violence. That violence is a means to an end, and that end is profitable crime. So they're being able to move into uh, this world of sex trafficking because they're finding more and more that it is uh, high yield, low risk. And the gang mentality is really important to understand when you're dealing with these individuals. Now, the girls that are being victimized by the gang are not necessarily gang members, as we would traditionally think of them. Um, they're not allowed to make decisions in the gang. They're not viewed by the gang uh, with the same level of respect, so to speak, that other gang members are. But the girls are being told that they are, in fact, part of the gang. They are being indoctrinated to believe that 
they are members or some uh, somehow involved in this gang family. And so the gang family is, is kind of centered around this idea of power and respect, where they believe to be power and respect. We know it as fear, uh, dominance, uh, basically, you know, sort of domestic terrorists, if you will, uh, where they go into these neighborhoods that they claim is theirs, uh, they exert territorial dominance and say, this is our area of control, and then they use that violence as a means to maintain uh, that territorial dominance. Gangs, as opposed to uh, those that are in kind of the pimping scenarios or some that are a lot more business-oriented, um, gangs not so much. Their primary goal um, is to not get arrested. They have a paranoia about law enforcement. They know that law enforcement has been much more effective at uh, interdicting and arresting them, charging them. Prosecutors have uh, gotten very good at, at prosecuting them for traditional gang-type activity and putting them in jail. So their primary objective is to not get caught. And so their operations look very different. Um, they have different methods that they use uh, to try to avoid law enforcement detection as opposed to the way that uh, the pimps operate or the families or even the mama scenarios that we uh, talked about. Um, they have this concept of blood in and blood out, and they exploit that. Uh, they exploit what Hollywood and the media tell us about gangs. There's various documentaries out there that exist that, that talk about gangs, but they only highlight the negative side. They only highlight, you know, how violent gangs are and how and the witness intimidation that we talked about earlier. Uh, and once these individuals think that they're involved in the gang, that they can never get out, and that's that concept of blood in and blood out. Uh, but overall, it's the gang. So this mentality of the gang takes precedence over uh, that individual's biological family. It takes precedence over school, over religion, over everything else. That gang is that, that primary responsibility um, of, the, uh, of the person that's involved in it. There's various types of gangs that, are, that exist. Uh, there's transnational gangs, which are what we typically think of with MS-13, 18th Street, uh, those types of gangs that extend across international borders into various countries. There's also the national gangs, which we commonly know uh, as the Bloods, the Crips, Latin Kings, things of that nature that exist here in the United States but exist in multiple states. And then there's also this group that often goes uh, forgotten, and that's our local gangs, or sometimes they're called crews. Uh, they don't necessarily uh, associate with gang banging, uh, which is a term that, that we commonly use. They'll more, they'll more tell you that they're hood repping. Uh, what these groups are is they're very specific to a neighborhood. They still fit the definition of a gang, three or more persons. Primary objective is commission of crimes. They have an identifiable name, sign, or symbol. Uh, but it's important to not overlook these gangs because we see that there is this standard pattern of evolution with gangs, um, the way that they evolve from very petty crime, destruction, graffiti, things of that nature. Uh, and evolve into much more sophisticated, uh, profit-driven crime. And it's true between transnational, national, and local gangs as well. Um, they've gotten very effective at, uh, at uh, basically grooming these girls and indoctrinating them into the gang lifestyle. And the way that they do that, if we can move on to the next slide, would be uh, substituting the, the idea of family. Uh, for these individuals. So whereas in a pimp-controlled scenario or even uh, the mama scenario, you're replacing that one individual. So it's that positive male role model that the child uh, is, you know, the, the, the victim is seeing a replacement of the father figure uh, for now the pimp, whereas the gang is replacing the entire family, much like Tina was talking about earlier with kind of those family-controlled scenarios. These are much more complex for our investigations. And we talk about loyalty to the trafficker. When we talk about all of these other issues, they're just compounded by the fact that we've now replaced the entire family, the entire support structure that this, uh, this victim has in their life uh, with the gang family. Violence is a demonstration of loyalty to the gang. It is also a means of control. So a lot of times what we see is that uh, these victims will have to witness the gang committing various acts of violence. And so this is a means of saying, listen, 
if we are able to do this to another person, sometimes even another person, another member in the gang, imagine what we could do to you. So this is kind of the, the sphere of control that they have. Um, female victimization is integral to the culture itself. Um, a lot of times it's a very exploitive culture, and so gangs are all about, they're very um, uh, self-involved, if you will. Uh, they're very much about how can we make money for ourselves. And so they exploit females quite regularly, and, and it's very common that females are exploited in the gangs, not always sexually. Sometimes they exploit them uh, to sell drugs or to hold on to weapons or to go in and commit uh, larcenies and things of that nature. But women are very much exploited in the gangs. Um, what we find is across the board uh, right now in the United States that most gangs are not allowing females to be members uh, of the gang anymore. And because of that, um, they are still being told that they're members, but now they're just being exploited for general purposes. So they're not privy to kind of what the end game of the gang is. They're not... Uh, allowed to participate in gang meetings or know about gang business, uh, but they're just being used for an exploitive nature. Um, the the use of violence against women as retaliation um, is really key as well. And so that we find that gangs oftentimes exploit some of the things that they've done in the past. For example, if any of you are familiar with the story of Brenda Paz, who was a young woman uh, she was an informant for law enforcement uh, here in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, and she was providing quite a bit of information um, towards MS-13, and this occurred back in 2003, so almost or over 10 years ago. <clears throat> what happened in that particular case is that she was offered witness protection, and, and law enforcement did everything they needed to do to protect her. Um, however, because of the level of indoctrination that we so often forget about, she felt like she could not be away from her family. And when we say family, we're not talking about the biological family. We're talking about the gang family. So she went back to them, and they got very suspicious. She had uh, written down quite a bit of information in a journal that she was keeping uh, that talked about that she was, in fact, cooperating with law enforcement. The gang found that, and in return, uh, they did murder her. And so that is still used. Uh, we know that some of the MS-13 gang members who are exploiting girls uh, particularly in this area, will show girls video clips from that, and they'll tell them, listen, you know, if you cooperate with law enforcement and prosecutors, then you're going to be the next friend of Paz, and none of them want that. Um, there are female gangs that exist. There are co-ed gangs uh, that are out there, and they function very much in a similar fashion. Uh, we have female gangs that are exploiting young boys uh, if, in the uh, commercial sex industry. And we talked about uh, committing those acts of violence um, in front of those individuals that they're exploiting uh, as a means of control. So they show them the level of violence um, that, that they're capable of instilling. So who are the victims when we talk about this gang trafficking stuff? Um, we, all, we a lot of times see the age of the victims being a lot younger. Uh, the gangs prefer the, the younger teens. Uh, sometimes they'll use the young adults. But they lure them in with this idea of fun and excitement. Gangs are very attractive because they're romanticized in the media and in Hollywood today. Uh, and so these young people believe that I can get involved in a gang. It's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. They're going to offer me power. Uh, sometimes they just really need that identity, that sense of belonging, because they don't have that at home. Uh, parents are too busy to pay attention to their children. Uh, maybe they come from homes where, uh, you know, they don't have both parental, uh, you know, both parents kind of in the picture, and they're not really, the parents that are in the picture are not addressing that void. They're not addressing any of those issues. And so these children lack this sense of identity, this sense of belonging to a family, which leads them open to being recruited into gangs. Peer pressure at times, hey, you know, my friend's doing it, so I might as well too. They're saying that it's really good financial gain, not necessarily because they're poor, and that's something that we really need to highlight here when we talk about gangs, is the victims do not come from low socioeconomic classes. They can, absolutely, but they're not targeting just those individuals because uh, really they can draw these kids in from, from really any sort of background. Protection, so if the individual is being bullied in school, and we all know that bullying is becoming 
uh, uh, more and more a problem within our public school system. Uh, and so that's an issue that they will exploit as well and say, listen, do you need protection? These people are picking on you. Join the gang. Nobody's going to bother you then. Sometimes it's a family tradition. Their father, their uncle, their brother was involved in a gang, and so they feel like it's just their rite of passage. Um, but ultimately, they really don't understand what being in a gang means. They, they don't understand the repercussions. They don't understand that there are consequences to their actions. Um, and so they get involved. They get in too deep, um, that blood in, and now they can't get out. Um, that, that whole concept, that issue. These victims, a lot of them, um, are just looking for family. They're just looking for that sense of belonging. Some of them have situational needs, so they'll target runaways um, who need food, shelter, housing. Um, they'll offer them to come stay with them, allow them to party with them, and then uh, after a while it's, okay, well, now you have to pay us back for all the, the resources that we've provided to you to keep you during this, this period of time. But when we talk about runaways, it's important to note as well that sometimes these girls don't stay away for long periods of time. They may run away for a short period of time, maybe just for the weekend, or maybe they're coming home every night. Um, this is really important to understand when we're trying to identify these particular victims. And the reason is, is because the gang doesn't want to get caught. They don't want uh, myself or any other law enforcement officer knocking on their door at 2 o'clock in the morning and finding that 14-year-old missing juvenile uh, inside their home. That brings too much attention to them from law enforcement. And again, they have that paranoia about law enforcement. They know that we go after them and that prosecutors and judges don't have uh, a lot of patience with them and they're going to, you know, essentially charge them with whatever they can. So they're not keeping them for long periods of time, uh, which is key to understanding them. Uh, these girls lack interpersonal relationship skills. They don't know what healthy relationships are like. They lack the support structure at home. They're seeking that identity, and some of them have some mental health concerns, whether it's low self-esteem, pre-existing depression, substance abuse issues, but ultimately they're just vulnerable girls for whatever reason, uh, and they're taking advantage of that vulnerability and exploiting it and causing these girls to engage in, um, in commercial sex. So how do we identify some of these victims? Um, and so, Dettina, did you want to talk about any of the things that I already discussed? Yeah, just quickly, especially on the gang control side. Also, know for our um, on the gay and transgender side in the DC, there's a gang called the Check It, and they're gay and transgender, and they also force people to work. So, gangs can be in, in different black backgrounds as well. With that being said, I think you want to pay close attention to some of the skip parties. I'm sure Detective Wolf will also talk about what we're hearing the most is that the girls and gangs are going to these parties, and they're called skip parties during the day. So this is during the day we use skip school, and your boyfriend told you who's in a gang member, one of your friends told you, you go, and they actually force them into a trafficking situation by drugging and raping them and videotaping it you know, on YouTube. So these are some of the things that kind of interfere in your questions about different skip parties, how they met some of the people in gangs. Maybe it's their family members. Some of the girls' family members were also in gangs. So maybe they saw a very different side of what the reality was when they also were it was into the gang. Um, I think every single part of what we talked about today, every different dynamic of control has something to do with family and having a family of your idea and then the negative impact that you seek a family to be. I think that's really important because all of these control mechanisms is based on a family, and that's why the kids are getting involved is because they think it's going to be a family that's there for them. It's really important to incorporate in your services to become a positive role model of that family. The other thing I think it's important to know in a gang control situation is that you definitely do go back to your home, too. So you go back, but what keeps you going back and forth? And so the threats of a red dot, so a red dot meaning that they may kill you or your family members. Now, where are kids being recruited and finding out about these parties are at the mall. So there are flyers at the mall. There are, uh, Facebook is also posting for these skip parties as well. You find out on Twitter. So gangs are, are using social um, internet to traffic kids as well, and getting them involved. Anything else, Bill, you want to add? 
No, I mean, I'll just emphasize the skip parties are huge. Um, it's a huge issue across the country that oftentimes we ignore. It's really something that law enforcement needs to be aware of. Um, that is one of the primary recruitment methods as well as um, social media, what these kids are posting online. It allows the gangs to, while our kids are in school during the day, it allows the gangs to go on and, and basically gather intelligence. They're going through uh, and uh, figuring out, you know, who are the good victims to target, who are not. Um, and, uh, and Tina's absolutely right. They do use this intimidation uh, and they use various things to kind of keep their hooks in these victims while allowing them to go home uh, because, again, they want to in, avoid, <coughs> excuse me, they want to avoid, um, you know, law enforcement from detecting what's really going on, uh, but they're maintaining them through uh, these various tactics that they've employed. Um, and somebody uh, wanted to know more about female gang members that are exploiting uh, young boys. Um, that is just so a lot of times in the gangs we're finding, and, and this isn't 100% true, but the majority of the time in male-controlled gangs, male-dominated gangs, uh, the boys are gang members uh, and the girls are, are used for exploitation purposes. In the female gangs, a lot of times we see is the females are the gang members and they're taking advantage of young boys. Uh, particularly um, individuals that may be questioning their own sexuality at that time. They take advantage of uh, those particular vulnerabilities because they don't necessarily understand uh, whether or not, you know, they haven't really come to the conclusion if, if they're homosexual, bisexual, heterosexual, whatever the case may be. And so they use that as an opportunity to exploit them uh, to, to cause them to engage in commercial sex. So moving into uh, victim identification, I guess, Tina, you want to take that since you do a lot of outreach? Yes. Yeah, so Courtney House does street outreach from 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. Well, not Virginia in the middle of the night. Now, we do not go on gang control tracks, but we do go on pimp control tracks. Now, one would say, Tina, wouldn't it be the same risk um, involved? So. Pimps generally stick to pimp rules out on the street, generally. They do not want to get arrested at all. So they stick to the main goals and rules. So it's very easy for us to do the right rules, but also reach out to the victims who are on the street in a very different way, in a disclosed way as well, not to draw any attention to the victim. That's important because gang control is totally different. So many of you know that I grew up in Chicago, Illinois, and I grew up in a very, very, very gang-controlled area. And with gangs, gangs do not stick to rules. I'm sure Bill will tell you that they don't stick to them. Um, it's a different environment on that where you cannot be on their territory. So we actually do not go to gang-controlled areas at night, but we do go to the malls where girls are trafficked during the day by the gangs as well. Uh, and so I think that's really important to understand your dynamic of controls to do the right research. But to do the right street outreach and to work with the victims directly, you have to understand the different dynamics and how to do it the right way. And I think that's important with street outreach. So we're continuously doing research online and also on the street and looking for kids online and on the street as well. And that's very important that we say that because those areas on the street change. So you have to do it online. So how do we research it online? Use some of the same websites that Bill had mentioned before, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and we move our locations in a discreet manner to reach out to many of the survivors, both boys and girls. Uh, drop-in center, Courtney House has a drop-in center, but it's very different. It's different because we only work with survivors of sex trafficking, and everyone has to go through an intake process first. Um, most of our kids are the four dynamics of control that we set, so we have an even mix of pimp control, gang control, family control, and boys as well because of the outreach that we do. Uh, I think it's important to work with a lot of organizations, community-based as well, because community-based gang um, programs for gangs and others, that's going to be a lot of kind of cross-culture and DP shelters. Your population is already going to be there, and we're going to be working with the same population. You just have to know the right questions to ask so they will be able to be identified. Bill? So I would just add into that, like from the law enforcement perspective, particularly if we're going to talk about how do we identify uh, victims of gang trafficking, one of uh, the primary sources that we get referrals from is from juvenile probation officers. 
a lot of these girls, because of the trauma that they experience of victimization, end up being court involved in some, for some reason, whether it's uh, minimal like truancy issues or whether it's, you know, actual criminal charges like assault or, or things of those na- of that nature, uh, we find that they are already court involved. And the, pr- the probation officers, uh, particularly here in, in the, the Northern Virginia area where I work, have all been trained on how to identify these scenarios and they're sending the referrals over to us. That's one of the ways that we really get into um, the gang-controlled situation. The other is, for, from the law enforcement perspective in identifying victims, is really just proactive police work. It's going out there, looking for the red flags, uh, kind of searching through our report management systems that exist, and trying to find these girls that are hanging out with gang members. So our patrol officers, street-level officers, that are, are conducting field contacts with gang members and they have one or two females with them. So asking the question, you know, why, why are they with them? Because most gang members will not allow their girlfriends, their legitimate girlfriends, uh, to hang out with the other gang members. So those are some ways that, that we're really identifying it. And then really, um, as Tina mentioned, some of those uh, community programs that are focused, like after school programs, for example, um, that's really key in identification and also prevention um, because we provide an outlet for these kids. We provide a location, a safe place for them to go after school, to do certain, act- to engage in certain activities, um, and I- training the workers in those particular facilities to identify signs of sex trafficking um, is one of the ways that we've been successful in identifying victims. Well, I just want to add really quick. I did say something about going to the malls, and then I said gang control. So a lot of people may not know what I mean by that. So a um, lot of traffickers who are in gangs do hang out, out. They hang out inside the malls, but outside the malls that the girls are working, that's what we're seeing more of. They're not always going to have tattoos showing so the police will pick them up. But what we pay attention to is maybe the various or different tattoos the girls may have, the way that they're looking at the guy, because usually the guys are outside, sometimes inside, but not talking to them directly, texting them while they're in the mall. So we're just talking inside the mall. Now, why are they at the mall working? Well, that's money. Men are there as well. Usually around the mall, what do you find? You're going to find different um, restaurants, bars, and hotels to where you are able to work. So this has always been the case. Pimp Control actually does the same thing as well for money, but different dynamics in different locations. Bill, can you talk a little bit about that just so they can, what we see at the malls and do you see that as well as the gangs going to the mall and the trafficking component? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of recruiting that's going on in the malls as well. Um, just like the pimps, it, they're easy to identify. They know that there's social hangouts uh, for these young people. Um, and so they'll go there. A lot of times what we're looking for is we'll see the gang members um, who are kind of dressed up in their typical gang style uh, so that they're easily identified because a lot of girls, uh, quite honestly, are impressed by that. Uh, impressed by the gang culture, and they kind of have this this concept of, you know, a gang member can have whatever girl he wants, so if he approaches me at the mall and wants to engage me in conversation, then I must be special, and that's how they kind of open the door uh, to that conversation. Should we move on to interview? So essentially there's there's two types of interviews that we're really talking about. Um, and coming from a gang background, um, you know, this was very common for me in that we were an intelligence unit. So we conducted intelligence interviews all the time uh, versus the actual criminal investigation. And intelligence is really important when we're talking about human trafficking. Most human trafficking units, in, in my opinion, should be located within the intelligence unit anyways because it's really all about gathering that information kind of understanding what their methodology is, how they're operating, how they're recruiting, um, and being able to compile this information. We're finding that uh, these trafficking rings are becoming more and more sophisticated. They're becoming more and more widespread. Uh, As the gangs are catching on, uh, it becomes very difficult because there's 
this division of labor um, that's out there with the within the gangs, and so they're really kind of separating who does what, uh, which makes it more difficult for us in law enforcement to identify as well as to prosecute um, these types of uh, these types of cases. And so when we gather intelligence, it's not necessarily mission specific, not necessarily evidentiary, but it's more of trying to understand. Uh, how these groups are operating. Before preparing for an interview, um, it's really important to gather as much background information as you possibly can. You have to have a working knowledge of the scenario that the victim is coming from, whether it's a pimp control scenario, whether it's a brothel, family, mama situation, or a gang. You have to be able to speak on the same level as the victim that you're going into. Um, and you have to be able to relate to them on some level. And so this is where it's really important that we as law enforcement and prosecutors recognize the value of bringing in advocates, survivors, cultural experts, um, people that really are in, an invaluable resource uh, to us as investigators as well as to prosecutors to help explain what this culture is, to help us understand better uh, where these individuals are coming from. And so we need to also review the background to this young lady. We need to find out where she's coming from, what type of law enforcement contacts she's had in the past. Um, and we can do that uh, by, excuse me, by reaching out uh, to various uh, people. There's various sources of information that we get that from. Uh, Tina, do you want to touch briefly on prepping for that interview? Yeah, for actually right now for police and prosecutors too, I, I thinking outside the box is important. So one of the things that we find with our survivors and ourselves, which is why we actually ask this question with our survivors, is actually in pull, pull their um, report. So you actually want to go ahead and make sure that on every survivor, even the minors, that you're you're pulling the not only a background check, but I'm lost my whole train of thought. <laughs> that you're also pulling their credit report. Now, why are you co pulling a credit report for a 13-year-old? Well, maybe you're going to find that things like cars and buildings are in their name that they didn't actually know about. Asking them questions about e different Social Security numbers that they had to memorize. So survivors actually have to memorize a lot of different people's Social Security cards in different locations that you go to. If you're asking that question, you're not actually asking directly. It doesn't appear to be on the trafficker. You're asking about Social Security numbers that will lead back to that. One of our questions that we ask our survivors as well is, have they ever been shopping? Did the trafficker buy them anything? Um, what malls did the trafficker go to? So that's important, and it's important because there are cameras inside the stores. When there are cameras in, you can prove the case and tell that up, that it is actually the trafficker who bought the clothes for the survivor. So when we're thinking about what questions, we're thinking also outside the box on how to build a case in a trauma-centered way, too. Our survivors actually like this part. Their memory is awesome, but they may not remember the street names. So we actually have our survivors also, when they get to a good place and working with law enforcement, drawing a map of all the places they were trafficked to in different locations and kind of making the key for that as well. So you're making this key and it's color-coded. All the locations that you went to, so you don't have to go out and point it to everyone. You can have a map and work with law enforcement that way as well. Bill, anything? I think uh, I think that's good. And, and so I just want to highlight with this slide real quick some of the sources of information that are out there. Really making sure that we as the investigators and the prosecutors are reaching out to each and every person that we can to kind of uh, build or compile that background uh, with regards to these individuals. Uh, when we're doing these interviews, some considerations, uh, location environmental considerations that exist. Public interviews are always best. I always try to avoid uh, custodial interviews or doing it in a police station because that's somewhat adversarial. It's going to put uh, the victim on guard. Again, we're trying to make her understand that she's a victim, and when you bring her to a police station, she's going to feel more like she's an offender. So possibly using a location like a child advocacy center or just meeting them in public in a McDonald's or a Starbucks, things of that nature. If we do meet them in public, we need, you know, try to make it a neutral uh, location, but be aware of your surroundings, particularly talk about uh, gang controlled. We don't want to go into a gang controlled neighborhood uh, identifying ourselves as law enforcement or prosecutors to conduct this interview. That's going to put her at risk, and it's also going to put ourselves at risk as well. 
I always try to tell prosecutors um, and law enforcement to be very cautious, especially initially uh, in the first, you know, couple of interviews when you're still kind of in that rapport building phase, uh, to be cautious about uh, taking notes because they're going to see that, uh, they're going to read what you're writing down, they're going to pay attention to when you're scribbling down notes furiously and when you're not really interested in what she's saying. And so that's going to allow her to control that interview and withhold certain information from you because now she understands what it is that you do or do not want to know. If you absolutely have to, uh, if you absolutely have to do a custodial interview, um, you want to try to make sure there's no barriers. Uh, in the interview room, and um, and again the same the same uh, message with regards to actually taking notes. Try to have their back to windows uh, to avoid them being able to see anybody else walking around. I always try to make sure the hallways of the police station are clear, even of other law enforcement officers, um, just because uh, there is some apprehension about being around uh, around them as well during that time period. Uh, Tina, you want to talk about language and approach? Yeah, I wanted to quickly say this will be the wonderful difference between um, the law enforcement interview and then the direct service interview. When you do want to uh, have them write or them see what you're writing and ask permission to see what you're writing, it's also really important that you work with law enforcement that you can vouch for too and they can vouch for you. Like Bill can say, Courtney Sounds is a great program, we work together. I can say, Bill is great, he's not going to go back and say anything, you know, he's he's going to treat you right, it's not going to be a different approach from a different police officer, He's going to be, he knows about this. You know, I can vouch for him too, and that's really, really, really important that you work, work that way together. So they may have had negative law enforcement before, so it's really important to introduce them to someone that won't treat them the negative way um, and working together on that. I know I rules that yes. I, I was just going to say it's a very valuable tool for an investigator to have someone from non-law enforcement, um, an advocate, uh, especially a survivor, uh, to step in and say, hey, you, you can trust this investigator. Uh, it goes a long way. But we also, just as a, as a note of caution, if you're going to have somebody vouch for you, then we need to make sure we do our job properly. Um, because when when Tina vouches for me, She's not only putting, you know, she's not only speaking to my credibility, but she's also putting her credibility on the line. So we have to be mindful and respectful of that. Yeah, also, I think it's important that if you know the rules that these girls have to, and boys had to go through, that's good. Use language, though, that you're comfortable with. Because, again, we go off of body language, and I'm sure Bill would say the same thing when he's interviewing. The first thing we do is see how we can size up the whole entire interview. So you may get a story of just sadness to see what you would say, or you may get anger. I think that's really important to keep everything even tone and expect that when you're doing the interview. You don't know them. They don't know you. So it has to be a mutual respect. We like to ask where we can sit down. We like to tell them it's an option for them to be a part of the program because it is. Uh, because remember that your choices were taken away before, so choice is very important. And I'm talking about a survivor, um, sorry, service provider interview right now. Not talking down to them or assuming or asking questions like, why would you do this? You know, we want to stay away as service providers for anything like that. They may mislead you, may not tell you the truth. Expect that. And I think it's good to say it up front. So at Courtney's house, we say it up front. We say, you know, you just met us. And you may not tell us everything. That's true. That's fine. That is okay because if my words do not match my actions, you shouldn't trust me. That's important because they trusted someone else's words and not their actions. So it's very important that you kind of say that up front. And also we always say that we don't judge you because we don't want you to judge us. That's very important because you think that if I tell you the truth, you're going to judge me. So I think you need to be honest and upfront and say things that they're probably already thinking first. You want to throw anything in there, Bill? No, I think I think you hit it. That's good. So uh, rapport building is really key, and we're not going to read through all of these questions that are on the slide here, but... Um, really, this is the most important part of the interview process, in my opinion. A uh, rapport building is more about engaging the victim uh, on topics that are relevant to them, so that they start to build that trust. So you ask them things about like being involved in sports or reading books or things that might be of particular interest to them. 
sometimes it's difficult for, you know, myself as a middle-aged male to relate to a 15-year-old girl. Uh, but, you know, we need to be able to do it and talk about topics um, that are relevant. We try to gather as much background information as possible before we go into that interview so that we can direct that initial conversation in that direction, something that's a happy topic for them um, and not so much uh, something that is going to cause them a lot of stress. Um, and then try to discuss something situational. So a tactic that I use is, you know, being aware of, you know, what kind of shirt they're wearing or, you know, as, as we go through some of their, their personal belongings, finding something uh, that we can kind of talk to them about with regards to that. Uh, so some of the safety concerns as well is we need to make sure that we keep the victims safe and away from the offenders. Again, it's a very victim-centered approach, which is somewhat different for us. Um, in law enforcement, but we need to kind of change that mindset and provide for those services first. Partnering with um, individuals like Courtney's House uh, who know where safe places are to send these girls, who can assess is it okay to send them home or do we need to send them out of state or what that is, and being um, mindful of those concerns and addressing them is, is really key. Do you want to address anything there? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. So then the, the elements of the crime, um, you know, it's really important that we, that we conduct our investigation, right? So we build that rapport with them. We kind of assess what their, what their level of understanding is, what's the appropriate language that we can use. Um, and then we need to make sure that we're using um, questions that are not going to cause the victim a lot of stress. So a lot of times when I'm instructing just law enforcement, I tell them, you know, we don't have to be as direct and get uh, as many facts as we, we are taught in the academy, so to speak, with these particular types of investigations. So it's okay to talk around the subject without being direct. Uh, we don't necessarily want to use words like prostitution uh, because that might be offensive to them. Really, we're just trying to determine um, whether or, you know, kind of do we have a crime here? If we do, great. We now open our case. We make sure that we get her the services that she needs, and then we circle back around and get some of those intimate, those more intimate details uh, later on in the process. Some of the ways that we can identify suspects um, is by asking the right questions. You know, if you ask her who her trafficker is, She's not going to answer that. If you ask her who her pimp is, she's not going to answer that. So here's some examples on this slide of just some questions that you can ask. Again, circling around the main issue is the best way to, to really kind of um, address this. Some of the other places that we look for uh, suspects is in police reports, like we talked about before, gang members being stopped with females, training street-level officers on what to how to identify these particular scenarios. Again, this collaborative approach, working with, you know, outside of our human trafficking unit, working with other units, other uh, organizations, uh, nonprofit organizations to gather that intelligence, to know what, they're, what they know, to see what they're seeing on the street, to hear what they're hearing from, from their clientele as well. Uh, some ways that, um, that we can identify other victims. Here's some examples of some of the other questions that that we can really ask, again, kind of circling around the issue itself. Technology and social media, I think Tina and I talked about that earlier, um, really understanding their tactics and how they're exploiting technology and the Internet that's out there. Um, your investigators should really uh, be kind of up to speed on that. And um, if there's any investigators or prosecutors out there that want some more specific information, on some of the technology that they're exploiting and how we're using it as investigators, please feel free to reach out to me afterwards and I can provide you with that information. Um, we talked about social media, their ability to gather intelligence, um, and how they're using it really to, to exploit these particular scenarios. Um, and these are just some more examples of the technology that they're using out there right now. And one of the things we've also touched on uh, a lot during this webinar is um, looking into co-occurring crime. So um, just as, as Bill has talked about a lot, that we want to ask um, 
questions about other things in order for us to figure out what other crimes have been committed. And we really need to do this for a few reasons. Number one, we have got to fully support our victims. We've got to know as much as possible about what has happened to them so that we can get them the services they need. Um, number two, we want to be holding our offenders accountable. And so if we are going to be able to do that, we have got to charge as much as we possibly can in order to let them know we, we know everything you've done. We are holding you accountable. And number three, we need to have these charges during a prosecution because as all of the prosecutors on this webinar fully know, you can absolutely think that you have 10 ducks lined up in a row and you show up and you start your trial and you have three. So you have got to get as much evidence as you possibly can so that we are thinking about Al Caponing every single one of these cases. And that means we've got to do whatever we possibly can do to get the traffickers and exploiters off the streets and away from our victims. Charge, 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 whatever you possibly can find the other co-occurring crimes. So the goals of the prosecutor interview, it, they're obviously different. Um, the entire time, these are, we have had some interviews that have been conducted over time, very likely, um, not only by advocates in confidential relationships, but perhaps advocates and counselors who may not have had a confidential uh, relationship. And those are advocates who would, for example, be associated with a prosecutor's office or in states that don't have confidentiality statutes. We need to be paying attention to that. Um, but we've got to keep in mind as prosecutors that at the end of the day, the buck is going to it's going to stop with us. Um, we are going to probably be the last opportunity to identify any additional facts and any additional crimes. We've got to get as much information as we possibly can, and how can we do that? By shutting our mouth. So we're trained to talk, 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 to argue, 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 but when it comes to trying to get information from these survivors, we've got to keep our mouths shut and try to be patient and get as much information as possible over time, while at the same time doing all these other things. Bill and Tina talked a lot about being able to tell a survivor, hey, I know Bill, I know the police, you can trust this guy. We have got to be doing the same thing along the continuum with the prosecutor. Because what do most, of particular our kids, think of the prosecutor? They think of law and order. They think that we're walking around all the time in these lovely gray skirt suits and that we never have any kind of real conversations with anybody. And if we're going to be able to help a survivor be comfortable opening up to a prosecutor, we've got to have people vouch for us. And we're not going to be able to do that if we're not forming relationships with the other professionals in our jurisdiction. We're doing this because, really, we've got to do all the things on the slide, but we have to be able to paint a clear picture to the jury. And we're not going to be able to paint that clear picture unless we have details, details, details. So during that interview, we want to get information that's going to recreate the reality of the crime. And we can do that a number of ways. We can ask questions about um, the shopping. We can ask questions about what you wear every day, why you wear certain things, what you do with your hair every day, why, how often you're allowed to get your hair done, do you get your nails done, why, who takes you there, what time of day, who lets you eat, and details about colors, about other things that you can see, hear, smell, taste, and sound. These are the little, little tiny things that at the end of the day are going to allow you as the prosecutor to be able to argue to the fact finder, whether it's a judge or whether it's a jury, that you can't make up these details, that the truth is in the details, that a person's credibility can be found in details. Um, we also want to know to what extent the survivor is going to be able to assist in the actual trial and assist in the testimony. As we know in these cases, a, a lot of times we have complex timelines involving several different locations and addresses and persons. And if we're going to be able 
to have a survivor assist us with an exhibit and that explanation, we want to um, know that, of course, ahead of trial. And finally, before we wrap it up, um, we want to be able to make our system seem as friendly as possible. Um, again, they probably have significant, maybe negative, but probably negative, preconceived notions about the system, and we want them to know that this is a system that's behind them, supporting them, and um, out to support the community and keep people safe. We are short on time, so I want to stress that for the remainder of the slides, if anybody has additional questions on uh, prosecutors interviewing our survivors, you can absolutely contact us directly. And finally, in summary, um, as we've discussed throughout the webinar, do as much as possible to be as prepared as possible. And um, educate yourself, not only by talking to the other professionals in your jurisdiction, but certainly around the country. And be patient, as Bill and Tina have emphasized. Make sure that your victim has those services. And if all those things are in place, we can continue to support victims and hold our traffickers accountable. Charlie? Yes, thank you all so much for participating, um, both our presenters and our participants in today's presentation, and for your dedication to increasing victim safety and offender accountability in your communities and across the country. Um, as you'll see right here, we have a little bit more information on Equitas's resources and where you can access those um, as well. And some information on Tina, you'll receive these slides, <laughs> including their contact information and full presenter biographies in a follow-up email um, as well as a survey link. We really appreciate your feedback on today's presentation and any constructive criticism that you might have. Um, like I said, if you have any follow-up questions, you can email me directly or send a private chat. We'll stay on the line for just a few more moments. And thank you all again so much for, present, for participating. And please do remember that Equitas is a 24-7 technical assistance provider available to respond to questions, concerns, and training needs as they relate to prosecution and violence against women. Thank you all so much. Have a great weekend.